thank you so much for taking time. We are on Zoom here with Dr. Thomas Sutton, or do we say professor? That would be Either better. one. Either, Either one. one. Professor's fine. Professor Dr. Thomas Sutton, PhD, who's the director of the Community Research Institute at Ball and Wallace University, and the author, co-author, I guess, with Professor Christian Incia, also PhD, uh, of a report, The Economic Impact of the Leisure and Hospitality Sector in Cuyahoga County, that you guys prepared for the Cuyahoga County Economic Development Commission, Department of Development, this summer, July 2023. Thank you so much, Thomas, for, for meeting with us and diving a little deeper into this report. It's fascinating. Great to be with you, Tom, for sure. Well, this is uh, really exciting, I think, that um, you get to do this work and sort of look, sort of lift the screen and look into the numbers and really get a fix on what our economy is really doing, what, what it's made up of, what the different sectors are, how they interact. And, um, and, and something that's up to date is this report, which just came out. I think it's actually, you know, fascinating, honestly. So I wanted to sort of go through some of these issues that you brought up in this report. I mean, first of all, do you want to give an overview of what, what this report was, what, it, what you were sure. charged to do with this? Like, what was your goal in, in creating this report? So um, Dr. NC and I have been serving as consultants for the county, Cuyahoga County Department of Development since 2021. And so our work has been to periodically provide data analysis for a variety of projects, in particular the five-year economic plan, development plan for the county. Uh, but then in February, we were put together uh, by Paul Herdeck, the, the director of the County Department of Development, with Sean Watterson. Uh, co-owner of the Happy Dog, and who was serving as a consultant with the Fund for Our Economic Future, really working on issues related to the hospitality industry, um, support for it, particularly coming out of the COVID period. And in discussions, we came up with this plan to put together uh, data analysis and also some field interviews with owners, managers, and staff of restaurants in particular, that part of the hospitality industry. This is also building on a where are the workers report that was done by the Fund for Economic Future that looked more broadly across many employment sectors, not just of the county, but of the region, uh, extensive surveys that were done, et cetera. So what we were essentially was doing was taking that, building on it, and going deeper into this particular industry to really look at economically, what impact does this industry have on Cuyahoga County, taxes that are generated, employment, net contributions to the county's uh, gross products. Um, and we found really data that's quite compelling. Also that in some ways uh, we benefit as a county in terms of things like our wages relative to the wages in this industry in other cities. Some of that being our cost of living being lower, but some of it also being that the prevailing wage here relative to other cities and their cost of living is in fact a little bit higher. So those are a number of the things. We did uh, field interviews. We did a lot of economic analysis using um, very sophisticated tools that Dr. Nsia uh, used. He's, in a, uh, he's a PhD in economics and is the chair of the economics and finance department in our school of business. Uh, and together, we put together this report that was then delivered at the beginning of August um, to the county and to the other stakeholders. So we had um, Destination Cleveland, Fund for Economic Future, the um, Jobs Ohio office here in uh, Cuyahoga County, and a number of others that were also interested in this. And so we would meet every three weeks to go over what we found so far, developing the report. And now the report is a public document that's been distributed to a number of entities um, that participated and certainly to those stakeholders. Right. And when you talk about the leisure and hospitality sector, can you just give us a, a brief overview of what that sort sure. of entails? So the larger, largest part of that really is the, the restaurant sector. Um, and that's restaurants, cafes, bars, fast casual, formal restaurants, et cetera. It includes all of your chains as well. So our focus was not on the chains, it's more on the local businesses. But then beyond that, you've got recreation, you've got entertainment, those venues that are both uh, serving food and drinks, but also serves in human venues um, like Pickwick and Frolic and Polarities and uh, Beachland Ballroom, um, Winchester, et cetera, around the city um, and around the county. 
Uh, also, our sports venues. So you've got the major stadiums, you've got uh, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, the minor league teams, uh, and then our arts destinations, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Orchestra, the Museum of Art, um, all of our theater districts. So that all encompassing, and then certainly finally, though this was not a big focus of the study, uh, the uh, accommodations industry. So your hotels, motels, Airbnbs, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Um, though Airbnbs are a bit of a gray area since they're not technically businesses, they are part of a network. Uh, but that in total is what we would consider, oh, and, and certainly um, the metro parks and other parks areas uh, would be considered part of that industry as well. Yeah, and a big one too. We just got a report that uh, metro parks is the ninth most visited national park. I'm sorry, metro parks you're talking about. We're talking about the national park, which is yeah, this national region. Park, right. Yeah but very much a part of the economy because so many millions of people do visit our parks in, in this region. So it's an important part of it. You mentioned there were some compelling highlights uh, and conclusions to this report. And I, I thought there were some as well. It sort of opened my eyes. Uh, first of all, how big really the industry is, the leisure and hospitality industry, that it's, it's actually one of the biggest, I don't know that we would call it the biggest, but it's certainly one of the largest industries in this region, uh, somewhere between 10%. And if you count um, additional uh, jobs and economic impact from this region, uh, from this industry, it, it could be up to as big as 15% of the, right. of the jobs and the economy in this region. I right. thought that was pretty remarkable for uh, a sector that's sort of overlooked and looked at sort of, well, that's just the entertainment industry. It's just nighttime. It's not serious economic business that happens from nine to five. Well, there's this entire nighttime economy that we're starting to now focus on and realize, hey, this is a big factor in, in our region. Right. And so um, when we think big, we tend to think of the big venues. So we think of Progressive Field and Brown Stadium and Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, and you're in those spaces with up to 80,000 people in the stadium and 20 or 25,000, 30,000 in uh, Progressive Field and whatever it is, 19, 20,000 Rocket Bridge Fieldhouse. But the reality is that the larger employment and economic impact comes from the places you walk into where you're there with 20, 30, maybe 50, maybe 100 people. And those are your restaurants, bars, smaller entertainment venues. In total, the number of jobs created in the county by this entire industry is over 90,000. Now that's directly employed and also the jobs of those that are feeding into this industry. So when you think about GFS, for instance, which is the wholesale food uh, foods provider, they're not, a, they're not part of leisure and hospitality, but they are a provider, a supplier to that industry, right? Uh, when you think about transportation services, those kinds of things are what we call indirect employment. And then what we call induced employment, which is essentially places wind up hiring people who are here, at least in part, to benefit from that direct industry called leisure and hospitality. So they might be working for progressive insurance, but they are here in part because of the amenities that the community has to offer, including particularly leisure and hospitality. The total economic impact of the industry, over $11 billion per year. It's a big number, um, even even in, in real numbers. We, we talk, to talk about, yeah, once you get to over a billion, you're talking real money. Uh, that's a big number, even in our region. We, we, we know from previous studies that there's generally more attendance at arts and culture than there is at sports. Um, you think, of, like you said, the 80,000 people show up, but that's what, is it eight times a year? I mean, uh, Whereas you've got this constant steady flow and we have dozens and dozens of venues of people night after night after night year round. Right. Um, and the numbers just dwarf. And so reorienting our thinking around where the impact really is rather than just uh, the picture that captures the headline, you know, of the full stadium yeah. once, uh, once every month or so average um, versus the, the, the stuff that's harder to track is what you're doing here with this report. Um, so talk about uh, more of the takeaways. I, I want to stay on the high level takeaways in terms of what you think this report should 
you know, executive summary stuff that that you think this, if if people read this report, uh, like I did, because I'm fascinated with it page by page, and uh, I think you and I are on the same wavelength there. But not everyone's going to drill down and read an 85 page report, uh, word for word, and look at right. all the wonderful graphs. It's fabulous study though, and I love it. Uh, but if we're just to look at the takeaways, what are some of the others that you would ask people to sort of uh, be cognizant of? Well, I would look at this as, uh, for instance, we have data towards the end of the report that come from the interviews and the survey data that we did, which was not comprehensive by any stretch. A lot of it had to do with who was a available at a particular time to do an interview or to fill out a survey. One takeaway that was an intangible but was real was the fact that the folks that work in this industry don't have a lot of extra time in between shifts, in between the lunch and dinner rush, et cetera. Secondly, um, a lot of this was motivated by the need for support for this industry. So when you think about other sectors like manufacturing, like healthcare, there are all kinds of public and semi-public supports, whether it's direct subsidies coming in from the federal and state governments, or it's special arrangements for infrastructure and other kinds of assistance. Whereas in this industry, you really don't see that kind of thing outside of the public arenas that have been built with taxpayer dollars, particularly at the, at the local level. So one of the takeaways was the need for, uh, from these interviews and surveys, for instance, the need for uh, information, just simple information that's easy to access about how to deal with a building department or the municipality when you're trying to open a restaurant, how to deal with the complexities of healthcare, of health standards, of building standards, of signage, et cetera. Because many people going into this industry, and this is a big part of also why the study was done, are people who are starting out small. Many in our immigrant communities, many who are in some of our poorest neighborhoods are finding their ways up the economic ladder in part through saying, I'm going to take grandma's recipes and I'm going to make those and I'm going to find a way to sell them to people and other people who appreciate that. And voila, you've got a restaurant started. And there are many that have started that way, certainly uh, with our right. ethnic restaurants, et cetera. Or with a food truck or what have you. And, exactly. and just exactly. getting it out and getting a name built and then looking for a brick and mortar to move into. Um, Talk about the, the study looking at Cuyahoga because of who commissioned the report, but what about the people that come in to Cuyahoga from outside the region? I mean, I wonder how that's accounted for in this study, because we know that um, these venues, restaurants, uh, arts and culture venues, sports venues, they attract people from much broader than just Cuyahoga County. Right. And of course, we get into the debate about why are we paying for this with our tax dollars when there are lots of people coming in from outside of our uh, direct county here to engage in especially the hospitality and leisure sector. Right. So uh, you've got a couple of factors going on. Um, one, uh, one thing that came out from some of the people that we interviewed, particularly those that are involved in entertainment venues, the smaller ones that I talked about earlier, uh, talked about how when a big event is being planned, so whether it was the 2016 Republican National Convention or the variety of international and national sporting events that we've had, the NBA um, All-Star Game, MLB, et cetera, et cetera, the draft for the NFL, uh, we all gear up. It's the big event, the big party. We're going to shine our shoes and make everything right. And that's and we pull that off every single time. All those people walk away thrilled, amazed, incredible. But then there's the rest of the year and all the time in between. And that's when there's a sense that the support that was there for the outsiders coming in isn't the same, isn't what it should be for those of us that live here year round. So Marketing was something that was talked about a lot um, as far as a need that these establishments have. Um, marketing in higher education. We did a set of focus groups with the Cleveland Leadership Center of graduating seniors, many of whom were talking about, well, I didn't know about this or that. I didn't know about these different venues. Or if I knew about them, I didn't know how to get to them if I didn't have a car. So some of these are micro level kinds of concerns. But when you multiply that out, again, a lot of this is about there are the one-offs, somebody goes someplace once and they enjoy it and that's the end of it. But then there's others who are really into the arts and culture scene, into the music scene, and but they don't know how to get started in that because the information simply isn't available in a way that they can access it. And I think that's where, you know, let's, let's remember that we didn't stop producing 
cutting edge music with Nine Inch Nails or <laughs> any of the other groups that we've had that started here. Um, we're still doing it. And our theater, same thing. But really, it's that how do you build audiences? I would use the Cleveland Orchestra as a really good example of an entity that's very conscious of the need to build audiences because a lot of what they used to rely on is no longer there when it comes to music and schools, et cetera. It's there, but it's not what it was 50 years ago. Um, and so I think that's another piece to this where the intersections between the restaurant communities, the entertainment venues, the things that people need to get to, particularly given our weather, right? We spend a lot of time indoors from about November till March, April, May, <laughs> depending on when we finally see springtime. Um, which just adds to the need for, I think a lot of it has to do with coordination, marketing, outreach, which are not high cost things to do to make this happen. But we're also very fragmented. Remember, we're 59 communities in Cuyahoga County and many other counties around us have versions of that same kind of split. Uh, and sometimes we get into we get into habits, we get into ruts, yeah. um, and we don't reach beyond what we're used to. We've seen uh, the rise of uh, events like Bright Winterfest, which uh, came out and said, we're going to have a big ass music festival outdoors in February. We're going to build bonfires. We're going to put five stages up. And everyone around here was like, this is what? This is Cleveland. You know, nobody really had done that before. And they said, right. no, we're going to erase that horizon. We're going to just let. And sure enough, it's super successful. They're working now with Ingenuity because they kind of split the calendar. Mm -hmm. um, but to say and be that bold and to come out and say, well, no, we can do this. We can be a year round city when it comes to this. You know, sure. I think of the Asian night market that came out and did the same thing with uh, the nighttime uh, idea of a, of a market or a festival that would have to usually close by maybe eight, nine, ten, whenever the music quit. But they said, no, we're going to we're going to start at about right. eight or nine or ten and we're going to go yeah. uh, late and you know when you go to other cities you you do end up seeing things that go late and later than you think late should be you know and we tend to be a little more midwestern conservative but uh, i i've been impressed with some of these entrepreneurial efforts to erase these sort of uh artificial oh, sure. boundaries dingus day <laughs> yeah we didn't have it we didn't have a dingus day 20 years ago or 25 years ago there were there were Polish Americans who knew what that was all about, but otherwise the rest of us were. And now it's again, to your point, one of the big events that's come on yeah. the calendar and yeah. rain or shine, there they are in Ohio right. city, Hinchtown, et cetera, Detroit, Shoreway. Um, so I think that's, and, and there was a sense that Cleveland keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. Well, we need to embrace the, we're here and we're proud of it. And we don't have to keep defending ourselves for who we are. I'm a transplant as of 34 years ago, and I have been, like many transplants, one of the biggest promoters and right. cheerleaders for this region. I came from a small town called Huntington, Long Island, quarter million people surrounded by small towns of a quarter million people, 30 miles outside of the biggest city in the country, New York City. I had a very warped view of what a city was. <laughs> right. But when I got here, I was like, I got everything, literally everything I could get on the East Coast without the cost and without the traffic. And that's mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. largely true. So it's we're not quite to the point of those Buffalo ads that have started where don't tell anybody about Buffalo. My brother lives in Seattle. Well, yeah. it's too late now, but don't too tell late. anybody. About it. Too late. And, and in terms of weather, well, Seattle has some nice days, but there's a whole lot of fog and rain and miserable now, climate change with heat waves right. and everything else so austin texas tell me how wonderful it is there yeah we keep saying right. come back we keep coming back we never went away it's like right. i'm sorry right right you know these these sort of invented uh events and festivals you know we we don't have to invent them actually we have cultural you know heritage we've got people that live here churches are still active the communities are still very active ethnic cultures that have been here for decades and decades and decades that do a festival every week there's more and more festivals we've got them in cool cleveland you could just spend your entire time going to ethnic festivals and seeing rich culture the food is amazing the entertainment is it blows your mind and and you can eat your way from here to around the world basically week by week 
So it's, it's kind of cool that we've looked inside ourselves for what the, the resources and assets already are right. instead of what it seems like a lot of uh, our, our leaders want to do, which is bring in that next big RNC event or the next, the big gay games. And it's going to solve all our problems, right? We're just going to all rally and we're going to flip a switch and it'll be sunshine from there on out. Whereas really what we found is it's better when these entrepreneurs start their own restaurants. And I'm telling you, we're in Lakewood here. It's, it's like restaurant row. Okay. Up and down the street. Uh, and the vegan restaurants, cutting edge, uh, James Beard nominated restaurants, you know, within, to your point, walking distance, affordable. I use the word accessible. Uh, to me, that's the difference. We have family in, in New York City. We visit all the time. We have our whole lives. Fabulous city, but good luck trying to get to anything, not just the cost, the transportation, the lines. You just can't do it. Most people give up that live there. They just don't yeah. even try anymore. Whereas here, yeah. if you decide you want to do something, 15 minutes later, you could be doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And it's and, so, and I, I would also suggest that there's uh, part of what makes us vibrant is we have that base of our ethnic heritages and personified in the cultural gardens. And yet we are also continuing to grow those ethnicities and new ones. They just you know, they just inaugurated the Pakistani garden. Yeah. Now, now, if you'd said 30 years ago, someday we're going to add a Pakistan garden or a Syrian garden, or now a, a Lebanese coming up, right? And yet we are, because those are populations that are moving in. I remember living next to our Syrian American neighbors um, for years. We've been next to each other for 22 years now, and in a conversation saying, so I know there's a lot, fairly significant Arab American population, particularly in the west side of Cleveland, we're kind of the edge of the crescent that starts in Dearborn, Michigan, and works its way around Toledo, et cetera. He said, so how many Syrian Americans are there in this region? They said, oh, there's um, over 10,000. I, I, you mean just Syrian American? Oh, yeah, just Syrian American. Just Syrian American. And that was 15 years ago. In fact, that was right about the time that the Civil War started. So who knows how many since then? Um, now, Ukraine, right? Ukraine, there was the Ukrainian community in Parma. And, and it just kind of, you know, gradually assimilating and second generation, third grade. Well, now we've got 85,000 Ukrainians that have come over because of the war to Ohio and about 70 percent of them. Now that's where they're living. Right. Uh, right. So so world events, we have we have pieces of what happens in the world all around yeah. us. The West, yeah. the West, Western neighborhoods of Cleveland, we've got people coming from Congo and. Ethiopia and Eritrea and other places becoming these vibrant communities as well. Not that that doesn't come without complications and tensions, et cetera, but still yeah. it's that kind of thing. And let's, let's also remember folks, Cleveland proper is sitting at about 370,000 population at its height in 1950, it was closing in on a million. So just the Cleveland borders, you could triple the population and get back to that number which means we have a lot of room, a lot of room. It's just right. how do we develop it? And this industry right. is key in terms of how that all happens and how it gets started. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I was just, uh, we were just promoting the Hungarian event last week and I looked it up and outside of Hungary, Cleveland has the largest Hungarian population in the, yep. in the world. Yep. Right And here. the largest Slovenian population yeah. outside of Slovenia. We just take this for granted. So, yeah. A um, couple of questions I had. I noticed in some of the anecdotal discussions that you did in this report, when you talked to people, some of them felt 44 uh, percent in the Legion hospitality industry felt they had returned to pre-pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. And I think 48 percent said they, that we still had a ways to go. That sounded like a kind of high number to me. And I'm just responding anecdotally. I don't do the research. I haven't talked to as many people as you have. But it is our business as well, Cool Cleveland, to um, promote a lot of the venues, a lot of the arts and culture, a lot of this industry. And we we get all the press releases. We talk to the people. We we partner with them. We we do some deep dives with them. Uh, I would call it more than anecdotal. It's it's a real finger on the pulse of what's going on. That doesn't sound right to me. It feels like 
um, we have not come back to those levels yet, to certainly pre-pandemic levels in most cases. And I wonder, do you think this is a sense of people when they answer a survey wanting to put a good spin on something? Well, you know, when you have a business, you don't want to go out in public and say, damn, we're suffering, you know, we're on our last right. legs here. And boy, it, you know, things don't turn around because people just back off and then, you know, it's right. a fait accompli. So you right. tend to say, no, no, everything's good. Everything's fine. We're doing fine. Uh, and a lot of times that is what you have to do. You just have to sort of tough it out and get through the tough times and uh, fake it till you make it kind of thing. But I just wondered if you had a sense of any of this, if, if you were involved in any of those uh, anecdotal responses or, or if, you know, we could just take that for what it is. Well, uh, certainly uh, we would have loved to have had a much larger sample than we wound up with. Um, we were under a time constraint, a deadline for collecting this data. So I would certainly put that caveat on, on that, those numbers and what was said. But what we heard really was, um, and I think um, it, the entertainment venues per se, so that subset of the places that we talked about before, they are definitely one that is saying it's a struggle. We're having a hard time getting people in our doors, attracting people with the acts that we have, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's definitely a sector where there's an issue. If you look at, you broaden it to the restaurant industry in general, I think that's where you're seeing more and higher percentages of those that either feel like they've recovered or on the way. And, and then the other question about, do you see yourself expanding? And there was a very high percentage, 70 or 80% that saw that, that expansion in customer base, opening a second location, that sort of thing. That I think is all the manifestation of what we keep hearing about, about people in that first year to now, post COVID, just wanting to get out. Even yeah. with inflation, yeah. even with the fact that prices went way up in restaurants yeah um and but it also has the positive effect that wages went up too and you know that chicken yeah. and egg literally effect right um and i i think there's also some habitual changes in terms of yeah who we are as a community now on one level which is a challenge it's a good thing because i'm part of it and you're part of it and that is that we are getting older as a county right the, the supposedly 60 and over is now the biggest demographic in Cuyahoga. Yeah, that's but that also tends to correlate a little bit with doing less cooking at home and more going out, depending on where you are on the socioeconomic ladder. Um, it's younger families that are having to feed four or five people stay home. Do you really want to take the kids to a restaurant, spend all that money and all they're doing is throwing the food across the room? Not necessarily. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so that's some of it as well um, that I think you're seeing feeding into some. OK. Of yeah. A uh, labor shortage too. I'm sure that you know if they only had the, uh, the the workers that they need, they they would be. So I think they yep. they see the business outside their door, but they can't serve them. Their hours have been reduced, or you know they're serving a smaller menu, or you know, um, but they they feel like oh, if only uh, I could be there. But I, I see where you what you're getting at. Um, Another question I had, it, it seemed that um, that the leisure and hospitality industry is not one of the, the top three sectors that are targeted, um, you know, economically. They're more about smart manufacturing and IT and healthcare, which the leisure and hospitality industry is at least as big as those and and certainly bigger than smart manufacturing. Um, and I just wondered if you had any interpretation as to why this industry isn't looked at as one that economic development professionals in this region should be focusing on as a growth industry, when already it's shown that it's one of the biggest, that it's one of the biggest employers, it's one of the biggest contributors to tax, that it has this huge spinoff, that it also then contributes to every other industry in terms of people wanting to live in a community that has a strong leisure and hospitality industry, great restaurants, great entertainment, great sports. Those are the things that uh, local companies of all industries are dying for because their HR people are, are promoting all of that to people. They're trying to bring the talent in. 
uh, and it's tough to bring people into Cleveland, as we know. And yet we have this fabulous sector. And I just wonder why, why are these other smaller se- Is it because of our legacy in manufacturing and we're just more comfortable uh, trying to build that back up? Or is it, is it just a blind spot that, oh, this industry is a soft industry, it's entertainment? Um, I, I just don't understand why there hasn't been a focus saying this industry here is one of our biggest, if not, if not the biggest, when you look at it compared to a lot of these other industries here. And it, it really deserves the focus, the attention, the, the funding, the grants, the studies, the, you know, the, the uh, higher level focus at, at, the, uh, at the political level. Do you have any well, answers for that? Uh, I think some of it has to do with scale and s- scale and numbers. Um, that when you're talking about smart manufacturing, IT, and healthcare, you're talking about even as new businesses, if they succeed, success comes through growth of that single entity. Right? You can't hypothetically decide you're going to make wheelchairs and make a hundred wheelchairs a year with two people and expect to survive and thrive in the healthcare industry. You've got to scale up and scale up fast if what you have is successful innovations etc and corollary to that would be that the 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 the, the fr- upfront investment in any of those three industries is much higher requires much more capital much more investment and often infrastructure from the public sector so because of bigness or being bigly so to speak um, that tends to attract attention from the public sector saying well bigger bang for the buck. We only have so many dollars to spend or to loan. We only have so many government bureaucrats to manage this, which keep in mind, you always have to have that. It's not just because they're looking for jobs. It's because you want to monitor. So you can't have it both ways, folks. You can't have small government and no corruption. It's one or the other. You're either going to get government people who are going to oversee and minimize corruption, or as happened when, for instance, unemployment benefits went through the roof during COVID, and there was no monitoring at ancient technology because we never invested. And now tens of billions, hundreds of billions of our tax dollars went to Macedonia and other places. And I'm not talking about on the eastern part of <laughs> Cuyahoga and Summit counties, the one overseas, right? right? So at any rate, I think that's that's where why they get more attention financially and otherwise. Restaurants, entertainment venues, with the exception of the big ones, tend to get less attention because it's so diffused. There's so many of them. It's harder to figure out, well, what do they need and how do we provide it? And the default is, oh, we have the Small Business Administration, right? The federal agency responsible for any and all small businesses. Well, that's nice, but they have limited funding. And their funding also tends to get targeted towards certain types of industries where small businesses are starting. So the bottom line is, until the county or the city of Cleveland or both dedicate some sort of, if even if it's not financial, at least informational support, marketing support, which is what our surveys revealed are what people really want. The two biggest factors in these industries in terms of challenges, rising supply costs and rising labor costs along with hiring and retention of labor itself. Um, but there's some fascinating data, not just from our study, but from the one that was done by the Fund for Economic Future, where they did interviews and they had uh, one business owner who owns a chain of Popeyes, like five or six of them, and who had a constant turnover. Uh, Because we're talking relatively low wage fast food workers, right? Finally figured out that part of the problem was the personal issues that their staff were facing, right? They were dealing with transportation issues, kids at home, sick kids, senior, everything, right? Sometimes family addictions, et cetera. They hired a social worker, one social worker, to work with the staff at these six establishments. Retention went up, hiring went up, and as, it, as, and as a result, people got paid more because if you stayed long enough, your wages started to go up. Um, and it just totally stabilized their labor force, one social worker. Now, what restaurant owner is gonna be thinking about, oh, I need to hire a social worker. But when you think about the nature of the job, and let's be, let's be clear, these are not jobs where you just sit around and do your job all day in front of a computer. These are high activity, high stress, dealing with customers, all those things, unpredictable schedules, all the factors that also contribute some of it the nature of the business, but some of it how they're run to that turnover and that lack of retention. Yeah, exactly. Um, on this same sort of theme, you know, we're looking at sort of conflating sports and 
leisure and hospitality all into the same sector. And when they do get compared, um, it seems like sports and, and entertainment are sort of on an equal footing in terms of their impacts. But I, you and I had briefly talked about this. I'm wondering how we account for the fact that we know that there are these massive tax subsidies that go to the sports facilities. And you and I talked about study after study that show that it does not pay off, that communities do not benefit from this, that the, the numbers don't add up, that these dollars leave the region. They go to uh, owners, they go to sports figures that don't live here. The money just disappears from the region, but it comes out of our local tax dollars. And I wonder if these are sort of equal in your report, which I look at them and go, oh, that's that's interesting. And that's pretty impressive that that arts and culture and, and sports are are equal. But I'm thinking, but they're getting a billion dollar subsidy over here for the sports, literally billions. I think Gateway alone is a billion. Let's not even count Cleveland Brown Stadium. I mean, let's count is what I'm saying. Let's count that in. I mean, how is it a different study you need to be commissioned to do to actually break those numbers down and, and take the subsidies out and say, well, here's here's what is really returning if you were to remove this, this, and this that the community was sort of adding on top of its, its economic impact? I think a different study would be necessary to just look at those two sectors as in and of themselves as opposed to this larger collection of sectors. Um, the other factor that you have to look at is really kind of the baseline of American culture itself. Uh, we have cable stations and streaming services that are dedicated in whole or in part to broadcasting professional sports. We do not have a parallel to that broadcasting arts and culture, right? We have public radio, and public TV, and HD TV, and public, which, you know, that's kind of loosely defined. Um, and so that intangible, that all the studies on what's the economic impact of a stadium or an arena, uh, it tends to, in the long term, eventually it becomes positive, except that now with the acceleration of, quote, being outdated after 20 years and therefore needing to build new or renovate substantially, that just, you really don't get that net effect, just like with solar panels, you know, well, you pay up front and five years from now, you'll start to see the savings. That just doesn't add up, uh, in, in, at least in what I've seen for these major arenas, et cetera. But the bottom line is that there is a cachet, there is a prestige. It's an intangible, but it's an important one when a city has one or more of these professional sports. And it tends to correlate very highly with the fact that it's a growing city that has more economic dollars to spend, which is where Cleveland was and where it is again today but not on the size and scope of the Uber cities like San Francisco, New York, et cetera, and certainly where you see places moving to, right? So Las Vegas now has a professional football team, hockey team, and they're about to get a baseball team. And they're drawing them from another older city, cities in California, right? So Oakland Raiders are now Vegas, and they started their own hockey team. It wasn't a transfer, and they're about to get the Oakland A's, it sounds like, that are getting really out there. Um, so that transition, I think, is some of this is stuff that's until American culture changes and, and we all turn away from professional sports as a primary form of entertainment. Uh, don't hold your breath. Um, I think we're going to continue to see this, even though the data and rationality may say otherwise. And let's keep in mind, these are also the places where you have the broadest array socioeconomically of fans from the shift worker to the billionaire and everything in between, there's something for many of them, not all, but many that contributes. And you can't say, well, that's a blue collar thing or a white collar thing or a rich man's thing, uh, because you have some people that will dedicate 30% of their annual income to be able to go to every home Browns game and, and just go down there before the game starts and see those tailgaters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. But again, to that same point, and we know this because we know the numbers are there as well. For every tailgate, there are 10 times the number of people that are going to restaurants and of all kinds, blue collar, oh, yeah. all the way up and down the line, you know, from your diners, all the way up and down to to your five star restaurants. So uh, and same with your entertainment, you've got your corner bars. Uh, we have a little band and we see all kinds of people in the in the small little corner bars 
yep. or the big fancy venues yep. where where the dollar cost is a little higher. Uh, and in general, sports are not that cheap anyway. So when you try to convince me that blue collar, uh, you know, is, is attracted to sports when it costs them a hundred dollars per person to get a ticket, parking, uh, and a and a box of popcorn or something at these at these sports events that's not what they're spending on the sports, on the entertainment side. It, it's a lot more affordable to a wider range of people. So to your point, um, it is about the data, right? That's what you're doing. You're putting out data. <laughs> These are facts. These are numbers. I'm just asking why we're not reading them and, and, and embedding them into our consciousness. And you're, I understand your, your thinking. Um, and it, I, I agree with you that it's a cultural thing. I'd like to see it change. I'd like to see us really look at these numbers and say, wait a minute, we're missing a huge opportunity here in this region sure. by not focusing on this and by continuing to throw money down this toilet of, of professional sports in this region when we're not getting the economic impact we think we are. So let's take that for a moment. And if these are so important and if they are so valuable and we know that they generate their own version of revenue, even though we get these sports owners that continue to cry, I'm barely making it, which doesn't have a lot of credibility. Do the same thing that we did to create a stable form of funding for arts and culture. We created the cigarette tax. Now there's issues with taxing cigarettes and tobacco, et cetera, per se, since we want people to stop using them and we're seeing the effects of that. But if we know that there's a captive audience that's going to show up at these things, and if it costs them another $5 or $10 in a tax, they're still going to show up. That's not going to stop them. Nobody's going to stop buying beer because you add another beer tax. Nobody's going to stop going to these games because you add another 5 or $10. So use that. So this is innovative public policy. Create a tax on those venues and their participants, et cetera, and then use that tax to support the broader array of what you were just talking about to support the startups, the expansions, the marketing, which are all low cost areas that could have high return. And that I think is part of what this report clearly demonstrates. We got very few people that said, please give us more money to start a restaurant. We got much more that we're saying, marketing, common information about what to do in dealing with municipal governments, uh, ease of access to staff of government agencies that we have to deal with in terms of opening. I know how to cook. I don't know how to deal with a building permit, right? So just those basic kinds of things were what the study showed. And so it's it wouldn't take that much, to be honest, to do exactly what we're talking about. Right. We just need the political will probably to pull something like that off um, more than And anything. imagination. Yeah, exactly. Because because right now, what are they talking about in terms of these major sports people? And of course, the big two are the Haslam's and the Gilbert. And what are they talking about? They're talking about them being able to redevelop the riverfront and redevelop the lakefront. And they want to be key players in that. They see themselves as driving the train on this with the county and the city saying, whatever you want, whatever you want. A lot of potential benefits, yes, for that. But at the end of the day... How much of this is about benefits to the public and how much of this is about the personal profit of these major industry owners? I'm so glad to hear you say that uh, because the data, again, supports this. This is not just a personal opinion or a grudge or anything. The data shows that this does not pay for itself and we should be rethinking this. So thank you for pointing out that it's really imagination and political will that we need here. Yep. Um, Another sort of way of thinking, I, I, I got a quote right from this report that sort of takes the data and makes it a little more real and, and says, well, what, what's this data really about? What are we, why do we care about this at the end of it? And you're talking about the healthcare industry um, becoming healthy itself, be growing. And, and, and the quote is the growth of these healthcare related industries creates a healthier and more prosperous population as advancements in medical research and testing contribute to better health care outcomes. With improved health and well-being, people are more likely to engage in leisure activities and travel, thus boosting the demand for hospitality services. That's a really good reason to support a health care industry. That's a really good reason to support uh, uh, the hospitality industry. I'm not aware of any negative social 
or criminal effects of participating in the performing arts or, or the entertainment industry. Uh, but we're all very aware of social and economic costs of, of things like addiction, crime, gambling, alcoholism, alcohol-related murder, suicide, traffic deaths that are associated with organized sports, casinos. How are these social and economic, and, and economic costs factored in to a report like this? Or is it something that we just sort of inherently know in the back of our minds, but we, it, it, it's the, it's the, you know, the facts and the knowledge that there are going to be remain unspoken or, or how do we, how do we sort of deal with the fact that these are not equal? Some industries right. are creating socioeconomic problems that we then have to come in and solve with lots of investment and money and pain and suffering police healthcare to, to resolve issues that we, for example, say we're subsidizing a casino and we know it's going to cause addiction. We know it's going to cause crime. And yet we do that. I, how do you as a researcher sort of balance th those those factors? Well, I think that becomes, again, it's, it's a great set of questions, but that really becomes part of another study um, because we were really looking kind of at broad economic impact without diving into some of those subcategories that are very important. And it really becomes um, a factor that do we care in and of itself about these issues infecting these people to the degree that we need to do, we want to do anything about it. So the example of healthcare industry creating these innovations, et cetera, creating a quote, healthier population, healthier for some, right? So my friend who got the hip replacement in January and was back teaching his spinning class in March is an example of he's still healthy. He didn't stop teaching that class. He's still going out, sailing his boat, doing this, doing that. But somebody living in another community with a different level of socioeconomic status is not gonna get that hip replacement. And if they do, they're not gonna get the kind of care or have the kind of time for rehab, et cetera, to be able to return to, let alone improve their status through their work, et cetera. So it's very much based on, in part, class. The casinos, fourth time round, we voted yes in the middle of the Great Recession for casinos to raise money for education and other public purposes. And 1-800-CALL-THE-GAMBLING line, right? Uh, and that's going to solve our problem. But how much of that money is being spent on addiction services? How much of it is being spent? Let's look at the opioid crisis and let's look at the dollars supposedly coming to public entities from these settlements. How much of that is actually going to treatment and rehab? How much of it is going to, into these alternative court systems that are being talked about by all these judicial candidates? I heard five of them last night at a local Democratic club talking all about diversion courts and drug courts and the importance of getting them before they uh, actually get before a judge. Um, it's all good, but the bottom line is we also have to be really patient because uh, we're, we expect results the first time, maybe the second time. We are very impatient with results that take six, seven, eight rounds before you get that result, and it may be a five-year period, which if you talk to addiction counselors and people who have been addicted, that's a pretty typical cycle if you're lucky. And, right. And, and we just don't have the patience for that any more than we have the patience for education reforms that if put in place today, you're going to need 10 years before you see the actual effects. Right. And you don't have the political will because the people uh, that are in power now are not going to be in power uh, by the time these yeah. these effects come into what does that uh, do for the election in two years? Right. Right. Exactly. You know, Tom, I so appreciate your your honesty, your forthrightness, uh, your knowledge of these industry, and your your sort of uh, courage and fearlessness in in addressing what are really the factors at, at work in our community. I think too often uh, we just deal with things anecdotally. Uh, this happened to me. I heard about that. Um, and depending on your again economic uh, socioeconomic circles that you run in. Uh, you probably don't really know the facts, uh, but by pulling out the data like you've done here, by, by really taking a deep dive into this leisure and hospitality sector in this report, it's really opened my eyes. I so appreciate you taking the time, and we've had a few conversations now. Uh, you're such an asset to this region. I, I so appreciate you for, for at least being as honest as you can be here, and, and that's a tremendous asset. So uh, really, thank you so much. 
Well, thank you, Tom. It's it's been a pleasure talking about this with you. We enjoy doing the work, and and I must say, uh, if I'm an asset to the community, you are a huge asset to the community and all the work that you've done with Cool Cleveland, et cetera, um, and just uh, as an advocate and someone who's been watching this, doing this, engaged in this work, um, and and it takes all of us doing whatever part we can to keep our eyes on what's really happening and hopefully sooner or later seeing some improvements. Right. Well, and our job is really to to follow people like you around and see what you're doing and to to put it in the spotlight and and bring it up. So I'm glad we have a chance to do that. We're going to put some links into uh, the study itself to some of the other materials. We'll embed some of this in uh, in our posts and in the video. Thank you for uh, willing be being willing to just uh, open the doors here and and answer all these questions. I, I, I think I sent you something like 35 questions and you were so generous <laughs> looking at that and not saying, hey, for, this is too much, but you didn't. You were like, no, this is this is what we do. Let's talk about it. So absolutely. Big absolutely. props. Thank all you right. so much. Thank and we'll look you. forward to, to uh, talking again soon. I'm sure we'll run into you. Absolutely. You take care. Thank you. Hey, Bye -bye. It's Thomas Mulready from Cool Cleveland. Have a great week in Cool Cleveland.